Hi, my name is Jeremy Shines. <clears throat> this is I Am Loved Church Discussions. So I was at work yesterday and I talked I talked to some to somebody about um misunderstandings and stuff like that. Um and this person was telling me about how we misunderstand things a lot when we hear them. And we or we interpret things the way we want to see them. When I became a Christian, I really didn't know what I was getting into. And for those of you who want to be a Christian or for those of you uh, who claim to be Christians, the thing that I've learned is it's about dying to one's self. It's about sacrifice in every area of one's life to completely live for God and for others. And Jesus did that. He represented complete self-sacrifice. And he calls anyone who believes in him to do the same. It's not about me or you or ourselves. It's about God and everybody else. And part of that for me was just looking for truth. What's the truth, you know? And God gives us all an ability to reason and free will to redefine that for ourselves if we so choose. But for those who want to be Christian, claim to be Christian, who choose to follow Jesus is what it means, are people who are looking, seeking truth. And sometimes truth isn't always fun to find out. Like if you struggle with something and you have a friend or, I don't know, somebody who tells you the truth of your actions and says what you're doing is wrong, our immediate human na uh, natural uh, sinful desire is to get mad and get upset or get offended. And that's why a lot of people don't go to church. That's why a lot of people don't believe in religion. That's what they call it anyways, right? Because they don't want to get offended. They don't want to be exposed. They don't want to be wrong. And, uh, you know, if you're like me, you lived your life in so much darkness to where when someone did speak truth, you got offended. And it hurts. Nobody wants to be hurt. And it can feel that way at times. But in my personal discovery, truth is good. It's really good. I mean, when I think of God, I think of him as cliche as it may sound like a father. I'm a father myself, and my one child, she's old enough to walk around and go do pretty much what she wants to do. She climbs up on stuff. And if she wants to go and pick up knives or scissors and run around with them or run outside, if you're in some sort of desert. There's these things called goat heads. They're thorns on the ground. And she runs outside with no shoes. 
or if she runs around with scissors, she's going to get more likely hurt. And we do that with our faith or not faith. We see people and we and we do it ourselves. We see people running around with scissors in a different way. It may not actually be scissors or a knife or running outside with no shoes and getting goat heads in your foot. It may just look like, you know, um, depending on alcohol for happiness. Or simply, you know, cursing. Or anything that the Bible tells us that is wrong, like lying or stealing. Now, if my daughter runs with these objects in her hands and she falls, more than likely she'll get hurt. She goes outside with no shoes, more than likely she'll get hurt. And it's the same way with sin. If we do these things, more than likely we're going to get hurt. Not because... Um, by anybody else, but by our own actions. And God, he, his commandments may seem harsh. When I yell at my daughter for not to not go in the kitchen because she's, you know, I just finished cooking something in the oven or on the stove and it's really hot on the pan and there's grease in there or whatever. And she wants to go and she's done this before, but there was nothing inside of the, those, uh, the pan or whatever at the time. But she's reached over the counter and she pulled things down and it hurt her. And she'd cry and cry. And I imagine that when she, uh, she actually has, you know, grabbed scissors and, we, and I saw her and I was like, no, give me that, you know. And I screamed at her and I yelled at her and she got antsy and I got it out of her hands, you know. Or when there was hot objects on the stove, you know, and she's reaching, trying to, she goes in the kitchen and I yell at her not to get, to get out of the kitchen. She doesn't understand while I'm yelling and, or screaming at her that she thinks she did something wrong. But she doesn't know the dangers that she's headed into. If she were to grab a pan with a bunch of oil or grease or a hot pan, um, a skillet with a bunch of oil and grease in it and a hot pan that's hot or whatever, or a knife and run and fall or, you know, it'll hurt me emotionally, but it'll hurt her a lot worse emotionally and physically. So when I'm, preaching these sermons, I'm not preaching them to hurt people's feelings. I'm preaching them to help people. I, I'm read, I read the Bible and I see everything that God tells us what to do and what not to do. When we sin, we're not, we're hard, we are hurting people in a way. I don't want to go too far into that but we're really hurting ourselves. And when we are hurt, we go around hurting other people. That's just the way it works. So, I'm not God. And I don't want to be God. And I'm not, my goal is to try to be like him, but not to be him to be the best that I can be. And he's taught me right from wrong. I don't know everything about right and wrong, but I know a, hopefully a good amount of things. As we grow and learn in this life, we're supposed to learn from our mistakes. I don't know your situation. I just know what I've experienced. I'm preaching from experience, from my own mistakes. I'm also preaching from 
seeing other people making those mistakes. It's sort of like if you've read a books or seen movies and seen all these things about what water feels like, but you've never felt water. It's knowledgeable or informative, but until you experience it for yourself, it, it's not, it doesn't really come to life. That is my relationship with God. When I read the Bible, it's informative, it's knowledgeable. But when I go into the world, when I go into society, and I start to see and experience these things, the Bible becomes not just words on a paper, it becomes real. And, does, and so does God, and so does Jesus. You may think a lot of things that I say are just trying to judge you. But if you haven't realized yet, you will realize one way or another that what most of what I'm saying is true. And I say that because I'm flawed. There's things that I just don't know. And I'm still figuring it out. I don't know where you're going to take out of this or any of the sermons that I do, but I hope you take something out of it. One thing that I hope you take out of it is that God is real. He sent his only son, died for your sins, so you can not only be forgiven, but you can have a beautiful and amazing life with him in his kingdom, and you can feel loved. My whole goal is to help you not run with scissors. Whatever your struggle is, to help you show you that you're not only forgiven, but that God has a new life for you. Not a temporary joyful life with video games or alcohol or sex or drugs. Those are temporary. Money is temporary. Everything is temporary in this world. God wants to give you something that will last forever. I don't know your situation. Seems like every time I'm trying to do a video, here comes some person. Oh, there. Wow. It's a little distracting. I don't dislike the person. I just, uh, I don't even know this person. Uh, I see a lot of weird stuff in the world. I wear, I'm a cashier at a grocery store. I see a lot of strange stuff. And I hear a lot of strange stuff every day. All sorts of things. This is really distracting. And he's whistling too. He's just the most loudest person I've ever heard. <laughs> I'm keeping this in the f in this. Life is strange. It is. One of the key things is don't get offended. Getting offended is going into this tornado of hell. And if you are offended, just forgive the person. When I got offended once, a lot of times, I'd sit there and reason it and yell and scream and all this shout. Why would this? Why would they do this? This doesn't make no sense. They're mean and all this stuff. And I realized... Whether they intended to do it or not, let's say they didn't attend, intend to do it or realize they did it, who's the one hurting? Me. 
I'm the only one hurting. And they're just going about their life. Probably, you know, after that encounter or, or however long I'm still offended. They're living their life, having dinner, smiling with their loved ones or their friends, you know, going to work. And, and I'm sitting here just still like in my little, little pity, pity, <laughs> pity, throwing a temp- temper tantrum. Uh, I forget, pity something. Loathing, you know, loathing about why they're wrong and I'm right. I had a lot to say, but then I'm like, eh, life is weird, man. I just feel like I'm just like passing through it. When you don't get offended, you learn not to get offended because you get offended so much. And then you just learn not to get offended. I'm the cashier. When I first started, when I was a cashier at another place, gas station, you all probably know if you're watching this, who know me. I was a gas. I was at this gas station. I was there. I got offended, and I walked out of my job. I don't want to say it was the dumbest mistake of my life, because I gained something. I learned from my mistakes. I'm not going to tell you why I walked out. I, which I'm not going to get into the details. I got offended, and got another job somewhere else. And. Uh, I left that job because I got another better paying job and then I, that didn't work out and then I went back to the job I had before that one. And basically a cashier again. And I'm like, bah, whatever. Didn't think about much about it until now, actually. <laughs> Just always being around people. And I get offended, man. I get so offended. <laughs> about what people say and do and da, 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 and how they treat me and just order me around like a slave. And I was going to quit. I was like, man, these people, I had even argued with some people, you know, I'm going to teach them. It was terrible. That Don't do that. It just makes it worse. And they ultimately win. That's what they want. They want to see you get mad. So I just... I just kept getting offended and all this stuff. And I realized, you know, I was going up and down, up and down and praying and like, God, why? Throwing a temper tantrum. Still do sometimes, but not as much. And, um, you know, at this time, my kids are pretty young and they're just, they're throwing temper tantrums true. And, you know, it's reflecting me. And I'm like, wow, like, but that wasn't why I snapped out of it. And someone would call it being numbed. Oh, I'm numbed. I'm not going to call it that. You just get numbed to it because you don't still an offense is an offense regardless. But not all the time that, that I, that it was the customers or people that I worked with. Sometimes it was just me. And I realized that I, I wasn't always up to par those days. I wasn't always having a good day. <clears throat> and I show up and that affected everybody around me. So I had to learn something really hard that I never really wanted to learn, even though I was learning it very slowly. I had to learn how to forgive I had to learn how to forgive people and realize that they make mistakes just like I make mistakes. So when I started to forgive myself for my mistakes, I was able to forgive other people and their mistakes. And then I was able to understand the grace of God more clearly. We need to be growing and we need to be learning from our mistakes. No matter where you go, it's not going to be heaven on earth. And the reason why is because it's not because of anybody else. It's because of our heart. And you take your heart wherever you go. And for some reason, I started to realize this and 
started to look around the world and think to myself, like, I'm not fighting with anyone in the world. I'm fighting with myself. I'm fighting with God. I'm not God, but I'm fighting with his law. I'm fighting with what he says is what perfection looks like. What perfection is. So when I read the Bible and I see all these commandments, I break them. But then I get punished. And one or two things happen. I either learn from my mistakes after I get punished. Or I stay in those mistakes until I learn to forgive. A lot of us are trying to be right. And I asked the Lord, I said, teach me wisdom about right and wrong. Teach me about grace. Teach me about uh, reasoning. One of the things that happens is when we're at fault, we love to reason. We love it. Versus repent. Versus forgive. We'll reason ourselves into hell until we're right. And we're not going to be ever be right. I felt like that God was telling me, go through this book of Psalms forever. For not forever. <laughs> but uh, go through the book of Psalms. Keep reading it. I just kept reading it, reading it. And something happened. I don't know. It was just like I read it. It was like this guy, David, King David, wrote a lot of it. But a lot of people in the Psalms who wrote, they were suffering from something within. And they were interpreting it on the outside of their life. What was happening within was actually happening on the outside. And it, and it, and it kind of just clicked for me. And I was like, I do notice that when I'm having a good day, usually everyone else around me is having a good day. But as soon as something happens and I get offended, I start having a bad day. I start seeing everybody else's you know, inconsistencies. I start getting offended about things. To get offended about something or to fall in sin, basically, you get thrown into the lake of fire where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, which is basically complaining and reasoning, everything. It's like partaking of the fruit leaving heaven, eating this fruit, and falling into hell. Falling into self-pity, that's the word. And you're never going to get out until you forgive. You have to forgive. I have to forgive. I wanted to quit, and God was like, don't quit. Stay there. And it was like an animal on the altar. And I'm flailing around and God is trying to, you know, cut me open. Peel off all that selfishness and that flesh. Sacrifice my body. And I'm just like, no, I don't want to. I don't want this. <clears throat> And that's the difference between being inside the kingdom and being outside the kingdom. People look at Christians and they think, to, I don't know, they think, oh, they think they're perfect and all this stuff. We're no different than anybody else except the fact that we believe that our righteousness is not of ourselves. We put our trust in Jesus he forgives us for our sins, but he also disciplines us. When I ask God for wisdom, he doesn't just magically give me wisdom. He creates a circumstance where I can learn. 
when I ask him for money, he doesn't just give me money. He creates a situation where I have an opportunity to make money, such as get a job or pick up some side jobs helping people. God isn't the God to just give us stuff like our parents do when we're crying. Here's a bottle. Oh, here's this. Here's that. No, God is a God of, I'm going to give you wisdom when you have an experience. And even to those who don't believe, God is still there with them, trying to guide them into truth. God can't control our choices. No, he created it. He allows us to have free will, but he won't control him. But he can control everything else. Whatever situation that you're in, I promise you, your life doesn't make sense or this is going on. The question I always have to ask myself is, what is God trying to teach me right now? He knows all of our sins. He knows everything about us. He knows everything about everything, what we're trying to do, what we're trying to think, we're trying to outsmart him. Maybe if I do this, maybe if I run away, you can't run away from him. No matter how much you try, you might as well just embrace him. And it's, it's scary. Embracing truth is a scary thing, but we're all going to have to embrace that someday or another. So I stayed there and I worked and um, I started to find out that pe these people were just like me. Some of them just had bad days or whatever. Some people just really never learned how to forgive and had a bad life, according to them. We all have struggles. Every single one of us struggle with the same thing. Some little more in others in different areas, but we all struggle with the same thing. We all struggle with lying and lusting and cheating and stealing and trying to do the right thing and gossiping and blaming each other. Some a little more in some areas than others, but we all struggle with sin. God doesn't just want to forgive us of our sins and heal us so we can jump back into it and do it again. No, he wants us to keep us away from it. He wants us to learn not to ever run with scissors because it's just a dangerous thing or knives or to put our hands on hot, greasy pans. And that's what our job is to be as ministers of the word of God is to teach people right from wrong because it protects them. And to love your neighbor as yourself, it means I'm going to look out for you, even if you're not looking out for yourself. Because that's what real love is. Real love looks out for one another. And Jesus said, love each other. He didn't mean allow each other to do whatever they want to do and not help your brother, your sister, your neighbor, when they're in the wrong. And he says, correct each other, teach each other as I've taught you. But the problem is people don't want to be taught for some reason. They don't want to learn. So they continue to run around with scissors and it may not be an actual scissor or a knife or a pan or running outside with no shoes and getting goat heads in your foot. It may be something as simple as how to, how to save your money, how to manage your money, how to take care of your house, how to be a wife, how to be a husband, how to be a friend, how to be an employee, how to be a boss. If I lose my job, I can't support my family. I can't allow gas and electric and 
and clothes and foods on their backs because I didn't want to get corrected. I saw this many times, people being fired for people correcting them. Or not fired, but they're quitting. They're like, hey, you're doing this wrong. I quit. They don't even think about their family. They're thinking about themselves. You quit? You're not even thinking about your family? What about your daughter? What about your son? What about your wife? Girlfriend, whatever. And you quit? I did the same thing. I wasn't thinking about anyone but myself when I quit my job over at the gas station. Or when I committed that selfish act. And there's consequences of that. We went through making pretty good amount of money to making nothing. My car got repoed. It was either my car or my wife's car. And she was crying and I was crying like, no, my car. And she was like, no, my car. We can't make both payments and pay the house bill. And Jesus sat me down and he said, love is sacrifice. So we paid her car, paid the house, and they took my car. It's not my car anymore, I guess. It was never my car, but I was hoping one day it would be. But if you love someone, you sacrifice everything. Love isn't do whatever you want. Love is sacrifice. I mean, I work, I'm not, I, I don't know. I'm grateful. I just, it's just never imagined myself. Just thought that I'm supposed to be, you know, like this freaking pastor or something. I'm supposed to be managing a church. I'm supposed to be in this high official place in my life. And I'm, I'm a cashier who barely makes enough money to support his family. And I'm not getting on my boss or nothing like that. I'm sure he watches these things, but I'm grateful. It's just, it's just some of us have such a high expectation and we're not grateful for what we actually have. And I went to school for a while and I, I worked at a lot of really good paying jobs, but a lot of those people were pretty snobby to me. <laughs> personally, because they know they make a lot of money. But I don't want to get into that. I'm not going to say everybody, but you know what I mean? There's a lot of them. So I humbled myself and I needed a job. I just needed a job. So I got this job. Um, I My boss is pretty, uh, pretty cool. You can reason with him. Just talk to him like a normal person, whatever's going on, and he's reasonable. But I've seen so many people not last because they simply can't even have a conversation. They don't even know how to have a conversation without getting offended. I'm not going to get into their personal life, but they throw it away. And they think that it's going to be better somewhere else. And then they think that it's going to be better somewhere else. Oh, it's just you. No, it's just you. It's just you. And then hopefully someday they find out, maybe they ask themselves this question, as I've asked myself this question, maybe it's me. Maybe maybe I'm being a jerk. You know? And then I go, oh, man. I have an, a realization reading the Bible a lot, having this relationship with God, the Holy Spirit telling me, it's me. Man, I've got a lot of problems. And that's the first step to get it, becoming a better person. Stop blaming everybody else. And start looking at your own heart. And I realized the friends that I've had there were people that came into my life, they were trying to help me. 
but at the time I was so sensitive. I was I was like, they're judging me. Yeah. And they're like, Jeremy, don't run with scissors. Jeremy, you're living in sin. Jeremy, you know, we're carrying these burdens on us. And our friends and family who, who love God and they really love people are trying to take that burden off of us. But we get offended and we go, no, I've lived with this burden all my life. This is part of who I am. I played the card, I never grew up with the dad, so many times. My mom wasn't there for me. Throw myself in self-pity, oh, because of this, because of this is why I can't be happy. I've used it all. When I seek God, I read his Bible, I read, I, I go to church and I, just have a perspective change and, and my beliefs start to change. Yo guys live in this self-pity for so long, you believe it. And yes, it happened. These things happened to you. I'm not saying they didn't. I'm only speaking from my own experience coming out of the darkness into the light. When I finally learned and how to let it go and give it to Jesus and lay it at his feet, and I have so much more freedom, so much more joy, so much more peace, so much more awareness of my surroundings and of others, so much for more love for others and my spouse and my kids where I didn't have that before for whatever reasoning that happened to things in my past. I'm going to take a quick intermission and just stop this real quick. And we're going to come back. We're back. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> and I've heard so much crazy stuff about people not liking each other in this town. And I'm thinking, like, I know both of the people, and they both complain about each other for whatever reason. And I'm like, <laughs> I've done the same thing. I'm sure a lot of some people know my dirt. But whatever. <sighs> Man. Yeah, it's it's not who you are. But you are what you believe, I guess. About God and about yourself. Oh, that brings me to my next point. Um, uh, wow. It was about belief. I'm going to wait for this guy. He's, he's, he's a really loud guy. You know one of those people who are like, they want everyone to hear him kind of loud. <laughs> I mean, like, I don't know. I'm not trying to be condemn the dude, but here it goes. I'm just saying it's funny. It's funny. He's like, <laughs> like, uh, from the Beauty and the Beast. What is that, Gaston? Like, <laughs> look at me. Like, everybody, everybody, look at it. Everyone looking? Ha-ha! <laughs> you know? <laughs> I'm like, oh, gosh. That's just that. That's who he is, man. <sighs> Shoot, man. I swear, man, I'd like... It's weird when I turn on the camera. When I turn on the camera, it's like... It's just weird. I love deep conversations. I like looking for truth. Not all the time. Sometimes I get offended. I'm like, ooh, that's too much truth for me. Let me, <laughs> let me back up a little bit. But one of the things the Lord showed me 
was about believing what it means to really believe. And, um, you know, going through the scriptures and just, I don't even know how to polite way to say this or direct way to say this. It's just, I'm going to try my best, but it was just simply about It was it was simply about just um, dang reason. It was about reasoning. I remember the Lord telling me first time met him. Not like it's normal. Like you know, he met the Lord. You know, face to face. <laughs> he said, "Does everything need to make sense?" I didn't know what it meant, but I'm getting more of a clear picture as I seek them. When Adam and Eve were in the garden and they, before they sinned, they didn't reason anything. They just obeyed. They were completely trusting in God and doing what he wanted them to do. They were naive about sin. They weren't even aware of it like children practically, right? They were fully connected to him, fully felt, they fully felt loved, peace, you know, all the goodness of who God is. And when they took of the fruit, they became aware of evil around them. And God never went anywhere they just became blinded to his to 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 his presence cut off from recognizing him cuz he dwells in complete light and it's sort of the sense of they were wearing they they were wearing no glasses they could see things for what they were in this clear untainted, contaminated, you know, it was holy, perfect light. And then the moment they sinned, it was like they got these, these, these glasses went over their face, you know, these, uh, it was like dirt got in their eyes or something, you know, and, it, and, it, and the vision of, of God, God became you know, blurry, and then, and even hearing his voice became blurry, because when you're in the presence of God, there's nothing but grace and peace and love and joy and just freedom from all sorts of judgments. So they were just completely naked. They had no shame and no fear. And then when they got cut off, when they took of the fruit, they fell. They fell into distortion with sound and with with the way they see and perceive the world. But God never left. Their awareness changed. And because we can think for ourselves, many people have created all these false religions about God. And, and so their, their persona of the world around them gets even more distorted. Their thinking which was supposed to be holy and perfect became contaminated. You know, it's like having a virus in your computer. Um, it starts to mess up, you know, or a car, your car starts to, you know, wiring malfunctions and it, and it starts to mess up and stuff. It's like we were designed for perfection and, when they took of the fruit, they, regardless of being the fruit, I'm, I'm sure it was the first, I don't know if it was the only accessible sin, but they weren't aware of different sorts of sin. I don't know. But they took of the fruit. Uh, they disobeyed God, so they disobeyed perfection. And they fell into their own thinking. And... God is saying, unless you went and, and, and they fell basically away, they, they went away 
it's like they they were in this perfect holy amazing boat and it was like a representation of god and they had everything they needed and they were tempted to sin and once they sinned the only people allowed on the boat have to be perfect they were no longer perfect so they were kicked out of the boat and if you think about noah and the flood of the earth they're booted from heaven into perfection from perfection into the water the water the the the, the entire world is f flooded like the flood of noah's ark that when during that time the water was so high it was there was no there was no mountains it was so high. It, there were no birds. The birds couldn't even fly above the water because it drowned them all. The boat of Noah's Ark was the only thing that had, uh, that was not in the water. The water is a representation of hell. And hell is a representation of reasoning. Right? Think about water. Think about how it works i mean just um, try to imagine it just it just keeps no you can turn it move it twist it shape it you know it just there's no perfect per um you know it's like a it's and what i'm trying to get at is like it's like our thoughts like our thoughts, when you, once you drop a water, imagine dropping a water on like an ocean, whatever, the whole ocean just gets rippled, like, and creates typhoons, and it's like, what's our reasoning turns into our reasoning, and our reasoning becomes like this. It never stops. It just goes on and on and on and on, and it just... And then we go in and it gets darker and darker and darker. <clears throat> and it's like, could you imagine jumping in the water where there's no nowhere to grab onto or nothing? And you're looking for shore or you're looking for something to hold on to so you don't drown. And a lot of us are drowning in our thoughts. And God is saying... The only way back into the boat, into the ark, which is the only thing that isn't drowning, is to believe in Jesus. And we're so stubborn, we're so prideful that we don't want to believe in him. So we drowned in our thoughts. We drowned in our way of trying to understand the world around us. And and we die. That's the whole thing. But those who repent of their sin, help me, Jesus, like they're, you know, drowning, help me, and Jesus picks them out of the water, and he puts them on a solid foundation. He puts them on the boat. And he says, what did you learn? What did you learn when you disobey my commandment? What did you learn when you didn't trust me? What did you learn when you didn't forgive that person? Personally speaking, I learned that to not forgive someone is to jump out into the water and drown into my thoughts, drown in my sorrows, in my grief, I mean, read the book of Psalms. It's all about this, these people who are drowning. And the one thing that they're all doing is they're crying out to God to help them, to save them from whatever they're going through. And some of us, we think that we're, we think we're so perfect. We think that, oh, you know what I mean? I'm perfect. And God kicks us out of the boat because he says, there's only one person who's perfect, Wow, that's me. <laughs> and that's a hard about our Christian walk too, because we start to think just because we're walking in obedience that we are God. 
and we're not. And it's this, and it's this sense of Jesus saying, unless you stay connected to the vine, you will bear no fruit. What he's saying is, unless you stay humble and realize that I am your savior, I am your Lord, I will share my glory with no one, God says. Nobody will, will drink the cup of my glory. All glory and honor and wisdom belong to me. This is what God is saying. And the moment that we start to think that he's going to share with us, like, like, you know, like he's going to share his glory with us. I mean, think about it this way. God created shapes, color, light. <clears throat> he created gravity, dimensions, every atom and neutron and electron. And I think there's another one and proton that make an, make up an atom. He created everything we see and the things that we don't see. Everything has his name on it down to the, to the, to the smallest um, point of creation to the biggest. Everything has his name on it. This phone has his name on it. It's because he made matter. The camera, everything, my ears, my understanding, everything has his name on it. And even though I go around writing my name on things, I have to use the fabric of his matter, his time, his space, his ink, which has lit all his name on it. And that's what we do. We, we're so vain. He created everything. He holds my body together by his word. He allows me to think. He allows me to perceive. He allows me to hear. He allows me to breathe. Every time we breathe, we're saying God. But we use his breath. We use the things that he's given us for free. And we put our name on it. We logo our business on it. My business, my name, mine. We walk around this whole world trying to mark up everything that already belongs to him. He says, in the beginning, nothing existed. And then I created everything. We take the materials that God has created from absolutely nothing. We take two things and create something out of it and say, look at me. Look what I created. I should be glorified and worshiped. And, and, we, and we never think about him. We not only not think about him, we blasphemy him. We don't think about him. We don't acknowledge his presence of creation and everything. We don't, we don't honor his, him. And the fact that we, we drag his son's name through the dirt. It's like, God, can I take this breath? And we take a breath. We unconsciously ask for a breath every time. We take a breath and we say, F Jesus. I don't like God. It's absurd. I mean, we take the very breath that he gives us and we spit in his face. We don't honor his name. We worship idols above him, above his son, put other things. We make plans above his plans. I mean, all this stuff, we, we just totally, and we don't thank him for anything, for all the food that he gives us for the clothing, for, for everything that he gives us. We're so ungrateful, so ungrateful. And then we even think that we're God. So let me run this to you for real quick again. We don't acknowledge who he is. We don't thank him for anything. We drag his name his honor, his holy, perfect, unblemished name through the dirt, spit on his face. And then we go and we, make, we mark up everything with our name on it. And then we claim that we're God. 
And he's just looking at us like, oh. One of the problems I had was thinking that to myself. This is what I've learned about my own self. This is what the Holy Spirit revealed to me. And I was like, wow, I'm vain. Solomon says everything is vanity, vanity. Man makes up all this wealth. Never acknowledging the Lord. And he dies. What do you think is going to happen on Judgment Day? If you don't acknowledge God, you don't thank him, you hate him, and then you claim that you're God. You think he's going to let you into heaven? This world is preparation for heaven. People who chose to worship themselves or they chose to worship this world. Oh, that cat likes being out here now, huh? That was probably perfect timing because somebody decided to just speed by all super fast. <laughs> it was just loud. And that's what, uh, what amazes me, really. I mean, I mean, God has control over every small atom in the air or the smallest part particle that exists. It's his, and he has a personal relationship with it. And he commands the seas. Jesus can walk on water. He's like, oh, he's just perfect. He controls everything. Everything is at his will. We're not at his will. We're not doing his will. I had to give up schooling because I thought that's what God wanted me to do. The way we show God that we love him is that we obey him. And if we don't obey him, then we don't love him. And the Bible is very clear about what God says is right and what he says is wrong. And for those of us who don't not just read the Bible, but don't apply the Bible, the Holy Bible, the one and only Bible, only God's word, then we're saying that we want to be God. And it's amazing because the Pharisees, they had this persona of what God was like in their own mind. But God is saying that I'm not even, I'm higher than you. I'm not even of you. It's like, I learned this myself, not myself, but I've learned this from the Lord. He's, he's like, Jeremy, I want you to think of your house. I was in my house at the time. And he says, this is as big as, as, as your house imagination can expand. I mean, think about that for a second. This is as far as your reasoning goes. Your reasoning can only go as far as yourself, as, as you've discovered. Even if you would grab all the wisdom in the world and read every book, God's thoughts are higher. Think about how powerful and how knowledgeable and how wise you have to be to create something from absolutely nothing. To create realities and dimensions in time. How smart and amazing you have to be. How wise and powerful you have to be. And to hold it in, in the palm of your hands. We could never do that. That's God's wisdom. That's his knowledge. And he says, my knowledge is even greater than that. It's greater than what humans can even conceive. Because we can conceive time. We can try to measure it. We, can, can, we, can know, we know it, is, it exists. He's saying, I am outside of your existence. I am outside of what you could ever understand. That's just amazing. What? You mean all, every every imagination of every human being that could ever exist couldn't, couldn't even think of one thing that you're thinking of? Couldn't even know anything that you know? And he's saying yes. And it's this idea of 
so what does the knowledge of fruit and good and evil represent? And it, it, for me, what I've learned from the Lord is it, is it represents control. Human beings are afraid of what they can't control. In reasoning, we can control. We can control our thoughts. We can control lots of things. Why? But one thing we can't control is God and people. We even try to control people. We try through entertainment or through the media. The media tries to control people and they sometimes succeed. God can, but he won't control people. Just like he won't sin because he can't sin. It's not in his nature to sin. So what the Lord brought to me is there are a lot of people who, who think they believe because they know the Bible very well. But I tell you, even the Bible can't save you. There's only one person who can save you, and he's not of you. He's outside of your comprehension. But he has revealed himself in a, in a form of a man as a door, and his name is Jesus. So I started to look at self-righteousness that I... I'm perfect and I and you know and then God was like you're looking at yourself too much you need to look at me and I st something happened in my mind I started to like God isn't I'm not God I'm I'm not God I there's someone outside of me who is God he's outside of my reason he's outside of my reality He's not me. Because whatever we believe about God, that's what that's how we treat people. I would say this much. Have you ever heard of the saying, I think therefore I am? To some extent that's true. But think about it this way. I think, therefore, I am. But God is not me. God is the great I am. I can't fa fathom what he's thinking, no matter how hard I try. So when I look at the Bible, I'm not looking at it a way like I used to, as a way to how to be God, but I'm thinking in a way of well, who is God. I'm not looking at it and saying, I can do that. I'm thinking, who did this? Who can do that? I'm trying my best to explain faith right now. I'm not looking at the Bible as saying, I can do that. I'm looking at the Bible as saying, who is perfect? So this relationship between what I think he's like gets torn down because it's not what I think he's like. It's not what I imagine him. What does God say? Love the Lord your God with all your heart was the second commandment. Have no graven image in your mind. Have no, thou shalt worship no graven image. A graven image of what we imagine him to be like. That's an image. But God says, tear down that image so I can show you what I'm really like. We have this depiction of what he looks like, what he acts like. When we look at all the photos that we see, of pictures that we see of Jesus, look at all this stuff. But Jesus says, I'm not any of those things. Those are shadows of me. The Old Testament is a shadow. It foreshadows God. The New Testament is revelation of who Jesus is. But a lot of us, we read it thinking that we can comprehend it. You can't comprehend time and space. 
that you think you can comprehend what God looks like. You think you can comprehend your his plan for your life. You think you can comprehend anything? You can't even tell what's going to happen five minutes from now. You can't even remember every little detail that happened yesterday. So it's this idea of, wow, full surrenderance. I have no control. I have no control over anything. And that's where God wants us. I have no control over my mind. Sometimes my mind goes on to random thoughts. Sometimes I don't even know why I'm thinking certain things. And sometimes I, I go into things that I shouldn't be thinking about. We don't even have control over our own being, even though we think that we do and we try to. How could we understand the Lord's thoughts or conceive him? And he's saying, anyone who lays down the fruit of knowledge, lays down their reasoning, lays down their way of thinking, and completely surrenders their mind, heart, body, and soul. Stop looking to try to control this world. The Pharisees did that. They read the scriptures in and out, and they had this pretty good idea of what Jesus was like. But the Jesus that I'm referring to and you're referring to are two different Jesuses. You may have a shadow of things, but don't you and I want to know the full truth? Don't we want the full comprehension of what God is really like? He's walking on water for crying out loud. I want to tell you this testimony. Hopefully this will be when I end. If some of you have heard of it. We lost our car keys in Walmart, ran around, couldn't find it. Last thing we did was sit down together or we prayed. We both prayed. Somehow she had the keys in her pocket, my wife. I was blown away. I, I didn't understand it. I couldn't reason it. I was in awe. I was like, you didn't put them in your pocket? She's like, no, I didn't. And I asked her multiple times, and then I was like, and it just magically appeared in her pocket. It didn't make any sense. That's the God we worship. But he did greater things than those. He multiplied bread. He walked on water as far as miracles. He turned water into wine. I mean, he resurrected for crying out loud and then ascended into the sky. And we read about this over and over and over again in the Bible. And we say we believe it, but for me, it hit me right in my center. And I realized I've read this Bible a lot. And when God finally did a miracle in my life, I didn't want to believe because I, I had no control. I had no control over the car keys getting lost or finding them. I was completely vulnerable. We're stuck in Elko with no car keys and two babies crying. Freak. Scariest moment felt like, you know? I can't imagine but, I mean, imagine if some loved one that you knew that you thought was always going to be there forever died. And some of us, we take a lot of things for granted. But God has full authority over it. And he wants us to surrender, to show him that we don't have it figured out and we never will. He's dwelling in a place he is in the place. He created all things. There was absolutely nothing in eternity. And he said, let there be trees. And it just went manifested. Let there be gravity. Gravity formed. And he was weaved it all together like nothing. Like, could you imagine if you saw that? Like, if you saw like this, this, person just literally create something like from absolutely nothing and just and you're like what? we get amazed at the little things like you know i don't want to bring in negative things but 
car keys reappearing and disappearing and reappearing in someone's pocket. I was like, and he says, if you can't believe that happened and that my authority is over that, how could you believe that I actually created all things and I have the power to bring things into existence and bring things out of existence and that I created the gravity and dimension and all this stuff? God is only going to be as big as we make him. And unfortunately, we've made him very small because we have to understand everything. And this is the hell that we live in. We live in the hell of our understanding. But Jesus is saying, anyone who believes in me, I will open up their mind and they will see amazing things. Things that are impossible with man. And it's like, don't you want to see that? Don't you want your life to just be nothing but that? Like, we watch these movies like, you know, Avengers or whatever, and we go, wow, that's so amazing, sitting down and just, like, perceiving that. Like, oh, yeah, cool. And Jesus is like, don't you want to see that for real? Don't you want to be, like, there? But on a more realistic level, oh, well, not realistic, because that's, you know what I mean? Just don't you want to be there? Don't you want to really experience real life? I mean, everything Jesus did, he said, you'll be able to do this and greater things. And as Nicodemus is trying to reason, he's trying to understand it. And he's just like, you'll never understand trying to understand. You'll only understand by only believing only when you believe, then you'll know that you don't need to know. You'll just believe. But the fact that you need to know, you've partook of the fruit. And that is your sin. You, need, you will die in your sin. So I want to end here. <laughs> and just tell you that God is, he's God, I'm not God. He's not of my thinking process. He's not the way I think. He, he feeds me with his word and tells me these things. It grows my faith a little more. When my faith grows, he starts to show me more miracles because I'm like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. It was so small though, but it's still, it's like, wow. And he's like, I can't show you angels. I can't show you what I really want you to see because you would be overwhelmed. I'm only going to feed you and show you little by little by little. So, I mean, I'm like, man, I, this God is, he's God. I'm not God. I'm like, wow. Like he's, He's fully in control. I'm like, so when I pray for wisdom, he can create a situation where I can grow wisdom in and in the area that I need wisdom in to the point where I understand it and I can get it. That's how amazing he is. He's like, oh, you want wisdom? Knowing that all these people pray for all the things that they need too, whether they need money or whatever, finances issue, whatever, whatever they go through, struggles, forgiveness, he can weave through all that, answer their prayers simultaneously and mine at the same time. He loves to do that. He loves to, he loves his children to pray and ask for what they need. Lord, help me love my wife. Help me love my husband. Help me love this person. Help me realize what, I, what I've been hiding from my whole life. And he can weave through every one of every single person's prayer. If, if everyone prayed, he can go, oh, the Bible says, is there anything too hard for the Lord? Oh my gosh, that's a challenge. Like, well, make me a millionaire. He's like, that's not, that's not biblical, first off. Let's cast those things aside. But that's what he's saying. He's like, is anything too hard for the Lord? Is there anything impossible 
for me. But he doesn't answer people who don't believe. Who don't believe he can do it. It's a heart thing, not an intellect thing. It's a heart thing. The book of James says the Lord reproves of those who don't who don't believe. I mean, the whole concept of the whole Bible is to believe. I mean, he he got mad when Israel wouldn't believe, even though he parted the freaking seas for crying out loud. But there's he's parting the seas for us every day, and we still are like, oh, it's not God. He has control of the fabric of time and space and reality and dimensions and the air and the every you know point and atom and all this stuff and we go yeah not amazing you must be blind then i came to make those blind see and those who believe i make i came to make those blind see which he's saying i came to make those who believe see and those who don't believe blind Two people look at the sunset and they go, oh, that's amazing. One says, that's amazing. That's God's creation. Whoa. Another person who's a non-believer says, yeah, that's by chance. Let's go sin because that's the only thing I find pleasure in. Oh. Well, the concept is Jesus is Lord. Jesus is amazing. Jesus is infinite. He's great and grand. He's beyond me. And when you understand that from within here in your heart, all that's left every day for the rest of your life is praise God. Praise. He's amazing. For great is the Lord. He created gravity. He created time and space and atoms and molecules. He created dimensions and realities. He created trees and all these things. Rejoice for the Lord. He's good and his pleasure towards his creation is to bless his creation and to bless it and bless it for all eternity. But those who don't want the blessing, they love evil more than they love good because God is good. God bless.